This podcast is part of the Batman Universe Podcast Network, hosted by the BatmanUniverse.net. Check out everything related to Batman and the entire Bat family at the BatmanUniverse.net, including news and original content related to comics, movies, television, merchandise, video games, and more. Also, check out some of the other unique podcasts that TBU has to offer. Consider supporting this podcast by becoming a patron on Patreon. Even $1 can go a long way in supporting this content that you enjoy. Look for a link over at the BatmanUniverse.net to offer your support now. And now, on with the show. this little bumper to put ahead because i i'm behind a couple of episodes i'm kind of slow with editing lately and that's a flaw of mine but the last time we recorded i mean covid19 was out there but it wasn't it hasn't hadn't yet impacted our lives the way it has now so uh, don't be surprised if you don't hear us talking about it at all it's amazing how fast things changed, isn't it? Right. Yeah. And uh, yeah. And it's not like we were trying to avoid it for or anything. It's just it hadn't blown up the way it had uh, when we recorded those last few. So, yeah, I know uh, at least one of my listeners, um, I won't mention their Twitter handle or their name or anything, but I know their father is dealing with COVID-19 and then the listener themselves is likely exposed. So if you're listening, you're in my thoughts and uh, best wishes to you and your family. And that goes also for everyone who's listening. Definitely best wishes to everyone out there and stay safe. Definitely. So we did get a nice message packs from the uh, first episode we put out of this book. So this message was over at the batmanuniverse.net. So that's one place where you can leave comments or questions. You can also email at darknightpros at gmail.com or Twitter at batmanbooks underscore DKP. Pax, do you want to do your handles as well? Uh, yeah, if uh, you are looking for me for whatever reason, uh, you could more than likely find me on Twitter at uh, my name, Paxton, P-A-X-T-O-N-H-O-L-L-E-Y. That will find me on Twitter. And I'm pretty responsive on Twitter. So if you're looking for me, have a shout out me there. I can be found there. In fact, that's where you and I kind of got to know each other. I think you commented on one of my episodes and then I saw the title of your own podcast, which is the I Read Movies podcast, the podcast about novelizations. And I thought, ooh, that's uh, right up my alley. Yeah. And then look where we are now. <laughs> You've been covering that first Batman 89 novelization. And uh, I think I was pretty close to either just covering it or I was about to cover it. And uh, so I was interested in hearing your take on it as well. <laughs> well, so we were on the same wavelength even before we met. Mm -hmm. So nice. <laughs> so this comment is from Chapman Baxter, another awesome name with an X in it. <laughs> That's right. I checked with him to make sure we could discuss it. And he's like, oh, yeah, definitely. So um, his comment was, thanks for this. I'm looking forward to listening to more episodes on the Batman Returns adaptation, especially if it can see us through self-isolation. But don't you think Max was still a bit cheap handing a $50 bill to the Santa Claus on top of a single? I mean, he was clearly doing it for the publicity, although I appreciate a big donation is a big donation. As for the penguin being born evil, we don't know how long he'd been in the cage before he attacked and ate, question mark, the cat, or whether he could have been a decent person had he been raised with even a modicum of love. Also, Gotham is clearly a very misogynistic, patriarchal society, but maybe the Ice Princess is one of the few women who could elicit everyone's immediate attention. Maybe there are some intersectional class issues, seeing as Selina is not simply a woman but a working girl secretary, which explains why she's particularly ignored and demeaned. The Ice Princess seems to be a celebrity socialite type. So as for the, the Max donation, a, a, a third name with an X in it. Oh, I'm filling out numbered here. <laughs> so we, we, you, and, you and I both certainly knew what the book was aiming for. So yeah, he was being a cheapskate by his own standards. Right. Yeah. I mean, and I think we even addressed that. Like he knew what he was doing. He knew because he showed them 
I'm giving him two bills. One of them is clearly a 50. So he knew the assumption would be the second one was a 50. But uh, and he circumvented that exact. I mean, that was totally planned. And yes, it was being cheap. But also, yeah, I mean, from the other side, we were just saying, I mean, you don't look a gift horse in the mouth, you know? Right, right. I also agreed with him about the penguin and the fact that his parents screamed at his appearance and the medical staff had such a viscerally negative reaction. There are children born with some pretty serious medical issues. So they definitely reacted very strongly. <laughs> and But yeah, Oswald is clearly very intelligent. And it's sad to think about the lost potential there just because he wasn't raised with any kindness whatsoever. Yeah, there's definitely some uh, nature versus nurture there. I don't I don't remember if we brought that up, but uh, I think they're definitely going for that. And uh, I mean, he brings up a good point. I mean, it's like you have this penguin character who I mean, yeah, he, he was born a certain way. And yeah, maybe he's a bit more animalistic. But I but if he was nurtured correctly, you know, maybe he would have outgrown that. You know, you get some colicky babies here. You have like a penguiny baby. Uh, maybe he would have <laughs> overcome that if he had been nurtured correctly. But uh, I absolutely agree that I think the uh, the parents uh, reaction to him and kind of how they handled him. Maybe they didn't know any better. That definitely led to make it worse. Yeah. And, and they didn't have social media in the day, so they couldn't get on there and ask other parents how long it took them for their babies to stop eating the family cats. So. <laughs> right. Exactly. Because <laughs> how do you know? How else are you going to know? Yeah. If they're first time parents, they're, they they don't know. But yeah, I think we mentioned in the in the first episode about how one of the screenwriters also wrote Heather's and that he's very much, he's not a nature versus nurture. He's like, no, you're born bad. And you and I kind of were like, yeah, maybe not so much. And I thought it was funny on retrospect, how he mentioned that the Heather's characters were mostly based on his sister. So I'm guessing he thinks that his sister was born evil and was beyond hope. I don't know. Um, so you can kind of see some of that coming through with the penguin just being born a certain way. And that's, you know, you couldn't nurture that out of him. So, but like we mentioned before, we don't really uh, buy into that, I believe. And as for the ice princess eliciting attention, um, what I meant was, I think it's hard for anyone to grab the immediate attention of a large crowd. Uh, anyone who's not a huge celebrity Probably I saw uh, about five years ago, I went to West Virginia with some friends and we saw Stephen King give a talk, which was really cool because we were all big Stephen King fans. And the moment he walked onto stage, everyone was riveted, of course. But when it's an outdoor arena with thousands of people and the person's just a minor celebrity, I figured there'd be a lot more talking among the crowd and not a lot of people paying attention. So that's why I joked about it clearly being a work of fiction because of how difficult it is to grab a crowd's attention at the drop of a hat. Chapman Baxter responded. He thanked us for the response. Um, he said, I wasn't expecting it, but it's much appreciated. Well, definitely. I'm not inundated with comments, so I love getting them when they come in. And he goes on, I hope you don't mind offering your feedback to any thoughts I have following the future episodes. Definitely. I think, you know, Pax, you're with me on that, that we'd be happy to talk about any comments and questions we get in. This is what we're here for. Absolutely. Let us know what you think. Um, and there's definitely some discourse and, dis and conversation that can happen uh, with some of the interpretations of these books. Exactly. So um, he says, with respect to your individual points, I do wonder what might have happened to the penguin had he been nurtured properly instead of being dumped and basically left to die as a baby. Although I truly doubt he'd have grown up to be the type of embittered sociopath who'd threatened to drown Gotham's firstborn before de attempting to send penguin carrying missiles at the entire city's population, mm -hmm. I fear that he might still have grown up a villain, albeit more in the entitled and seemingly respectable Trump or Weinstein mode. I apologize if I overstepped my any mark by bringing politics into the discussion. Normally, I don't discuss politics on my podcast, but <clears throat> I agree. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he goes on. Then again, without extensive plastic surgery, he'd still have been shunned for his appearance and treated like a freak, irrespective of his wealth and family's heritage. So, yeah, people are uh, dicks. So I could definitely see that being the case. Anything to add on there so far? Anything, any pop? thoughts popping up with you uh no no i'm just i'm glad for the feedback and it was it was pretty good feedback as well yeah definitely he says personally i still like to believe that had this penguin been nurtured properly he might have had a chance to be a semi-decent semi member of society since i don't like to think anyone is born evil or incapable of being reformed at an early age and i agree with that 100 percent 
Yeah. But yeah, thank you so much for that conversation there. And uh, feel free to hop in with questions and comments on future episodes and chapters. And that goes for everybody else as well. Greetings, Gothamites. Welcome to episode 24 of Batman Books, The Dark Knight in Prose, where the only pictures are those in the imagination. I'm Lane. And whether you want me or not, I am back. This Pax. Nice. Welcome back, Pax. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I have someone with me to kind of talk about this book. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot going on here. Yeah, it makes it a lot more fun. With the the Vax novel, there's there was a lot to digest. And I even though it probably would have been better with someone, I, I could handle it. But this, uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm gl- I, I want to be able to bounce some, some dialogue off with yeah. someone. So we're covering chapters 6 through 10 tonight of the novelization of Batman Returns. So overall impression, like, do we want to kind of touch on that first? Or should we leave that for afterward, do you think? Um, I don't know. It's up to you. I hadn't actually even thought about it. So... <laughs> Yeah, I haven't either, so I'm just kind of throwing us both under the bus. Well, well, let's dive in, with, and we'll kind of, I guess, hash it out as we yeah. discuss it when we synopsize. Okay. Chapter 6, Scene 1 Bruce Wayne sat in the darkness. Alfred hadn't returned home from his Christmas errands yet, and Bruce was all alone in Wayne Manor. Alone in the dark and quiet, alone with his thoughts. Bruce didn't like going out in crowds much at night. It reminded him too much of another winter night, when he was only a boy. His parents had taken him into downtown Gotham City earlier that day, and they had all stayed until long after dark. They had had a wonderful time that day, going shopping, having dinner, going to a show. Bruce could never remember having such a good time with his parents. It was a day filled with nothing but laughter. And then... Bruce closed his eyes, but he could still see the gunman who stepped out of the shadows to rob his parents. He could still see his father put up a fight, see his mother's mouth open as she cried for help, and he saw the double flash of the gun as two bullets killed both father and mother. They had taken his parents away from him. Now he would make them pay. He opened his eyes and saw the light shining in the window. The symbol, a silhouette of a bat in a pool of yellow light. Bruce smiled. He was needed. Chapter 6 starts out with, from Bruce's point of view, He's sitting home alone in the dark. <laughs> as as Batman and Bruce are wont to do. <laughs> yes. If there's not an Alfred there with him, I, I'm guessing he just kind of shuts down like a robot who's been unplugged and waits for his butler to come back. Yes. But but yeah, he's just he's kind of sitting home alone in the dark because Alfred hasn't yet returned from Christmas shopping. And Bruce apparently doesn't like going out in crowds at night. What? <laughs> Which is it's a funny thing. So, I mean, I guess it goes to show a little bit more of, like, they're separating Bruce Wayne from Batman. Yeah. And so yeah. it's a little bit more division between those two characters, which I know a lot of people like to do. Um, so, I mean, I, I kind of get that a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like that. And, of course, the reason he doesn't like going out at night is because it was dark when his parents were killed. So we're getting the the necessary discussion of the death of the parents the rehash of the origin yep yes i mean i guess they have to assume that not everyone either read the first one or saw the first movie i guess um but i i don't think we need the rehash of the origin here every once in a while either a movie or a tv show or comic whatever th- they'll show the origin story in kind of like an interesting new bent like the gotham tv series one thing i really liked about that one um, David Mazous is a great actor and he was a great young Bruce Wayne. And what they did different is they kind of showed it happening in real time and not as a memory. Mm-hmm. But aside from that and aside from a few other examples, um, I can't remember who was telling me. It might have been John and Maggie from the Married with Comics podcast, but someone was mentioning how they're just getting a little tired of the constant rehashing <laughs> of the, cause it's like every single story we come across with Batman and they have to say that again. So I, I mean, I can definitely see why, why, pe- why people would get kind of tired of that. So yeah, yeah, especially if you're reading a lot of it. I mean, if you're new to it, it works. But if you're like right, us and right. you're reading a bunch of stuff, then it's like, all right, you know, I get it. His parents were killed. Okay, move on. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, he opens his eyes and he sees the bat signal, which makes him smile. <laughs> uh, I like I like this in the movie. In the movie, it's it's kind of you see him sitting there in thought in his in his uh, 
office. Um, but what you get in the movie is not just the signal uh, coming through the window. You actually get like this automated delivery system of the uh, the signal. If you remember, like the signal goes up in the sky and then you see these spotlights kind of turn to each other. I don't know if they're mirrors or something. And they flip through and then uh, you see two or three on Wayne Manor turning and sh- shooting the uh, bat signal through the window of that office. And uh, oh. and then that's when it shows up on the wall there. It's actually like a little delivery system. I don't even know what to call it, like the bat delivery signal delivery system or something. <laughs> and it's great. I always love that little touch. I thought it was great. And I was kind of surprised not to see it here. I wonder if that was something that just came up on set. Yeah, possibly, because I've always wondered – you know, how they know when the bat signal is shining. And you sometimes, how long does Jim Gordon have to stand out there and wait, <laughs> hoping that Bruce Wayne or Alfred see it? Because most of their time is spent down in the bat cave, if not in the interior parts of Wayne Manor. True. So if it were up to me, <laughs> like it would come dawn. I'm like, oh, oh crap, the, the, the signal's shining. But yeah, so just a, a short little bit from Bruce's point of view at the beginning of chapter six. Chapter 6, Scene 2 This was going so well. First the cyclists, then the acrobats, and now the rest of his merry band. It was getting to be a real circus. The fire breather smashed the window of the toy store. He stuck that rod of his in his mouth and breathed fire over the whole display window. The entire place went up in flames. That precious ice princess ran away, pushing an elderly woman to the ground. Oh dear, look at the old bag. She'd fallen and she couldn't get up. In a minute or two, she was sure to be trampled. So the second scene is from Penguin's point of view. And the scene brings us back to all the cyclists and acrobats. And kind of, I was going to joke about, you know, all nine of them that were too much for the GCPD. (laughs) But it looks like we have a few more added to the menagerie going on here. We have a fire breather who smashes a display window of a toy store. Mm Mm-hmm. And then breathes flame into the display and the building goes up in flames. What's kind of struck me, it when it says it went up in flames, it just makes me think that it either like an accelerant was used or it was just like kindling, like it went up quickly. Right. Yeah, that's true because a lot of those structures are like brick or stone. Right. So they're uh-huh. not going to just go lit up. Uh, like crazy. I mean, yeah, you're right. I mean, that's a good point. I didn't, honestly, I didn't even think about that. I like, I like the idea of this. Like circus of crime kind of thing. I, mm-hmm. I think it's a cool idea. It's very Tim Burton, but I, I feel like it's been used outside of this. Like, I think they call it the Red Circle Gang in here, and I think that's a thing from the comics. I can't remember specifically, but I really like the idea of this kind of like notorious uh, circus of crime, and it has all these like circusy type people in it um, that that do crimes and heists and stuff like that. I think that's a cool idea. Yeah, I, it feels like more of a Joker thing to me. Yeah. <laughs> so it's. You know, I'm not like incredibly well versed in Batman lore, but I I can't stop thinking about Joker for these scenes more than more so than the Penguin. But yeah, I, but I know I've seen more of the Joker than I have of the Penguin. Most of the Penguin I've seen has been either the '66 Batman or let's see, we have again the the TV show Gotham mm-hmm. and um, some of the Arkham games, which basically shows Penguin as a, a like an arms dealer. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's true. Uh, do you know if if Penguin has a history of kind of working with uh, people like this? Uh, not, I mean, that's just it. Not that I can remember. Like, I know I was trying to remember if the Red Circle Gang or the Red Triangle Gang—I can't remember what they're called in the comics—if they worked with Penguin or if they worked with like. Uh, there's also that group, the the Royal Flesh Gang, uh, and like they all have these very similar motifs and. Uh, I I, I want to say the penguin has worked with them before, but I don't think they're necessarily always affili- affiliated with each other. Okay, okay. So um, let's see. The ice princess who was there earlier lighting up the Christmas tree runs away, and we get a scene of her pushing an elderly woman all the way. <laughs> yes. And this poor woman can't get up and is sure to be trampled. And the penguin, who is the viewer, of course, is laughing from his vantage point, and. He thinks that if his plan goes right, it will be the last time he has to stay in a sewer. And he sees the black and yellow signal and he says, ooh, Batman, I'm trembling. (laughs) And I was kind of thinking, you know, as far as we know at this point, like he's basically maybe lived, uh, you know, I don't know uh, about this character yet. Um, They make it seem like he's lived most of his life in the sewer. And so he's at this point, we don't know if he's really ever been tested 
And if he has lived his life away from society, my guess is that the stress of mingling with among the masses in and of itself would make him tremble. But okay, he's he's already got a strong sense of himself and... um that's good. That's good, I guess. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And I mean, clearly he's been keeping abreast of what's going on in Gotham because he knows who Batman is. He knows what that right. means. He knows what the signal is. He he has connections with all these circus people. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, clearly he's doing, you know, he's keeping track of what's going on up on the surface. So, uh, like, so I, I think it's taken all these years and he's finally ready to come on up. Um, you, know, like you had mentioned, I really like, you mentioned the ice princess knocking over the old lady. And I was like, I, it made me laugh because they made like a, or kind of an oblique, uh, she's fallen and she can't get up joke. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. like, I mean, this movie, I was like, when was that? I'm trying to remember when that commercial was because it had to be years before this movie. Um, I was just wondering how relevant that joke was, but it made me laugh. So I guess it wasn't that. <laughs> But that, I think, is uh, most of what happens in Chapter 6. Mm-hmm. We we see Bruce sitting in Wayne Manor, and he, he gets the summons to come into to, uh, Gotham City, and the, uh, the fire breather and the other circus people are still running amok among the crowd. Yep. So, and it was a very short chapter. I, I was, <laughs> I, I keep forgetting how short some of these chapters in here. So I went to turn the page. And I was like, oh, that, that was it. Yeah, there, there are a couple here that are real short. And then we have a couple that have some good meaty stuff into it. Yeah, which I think is a good balance to have. It makes us feel like we're getting through the book quite quickly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Because like in the other books I've done, it would have taken me, what, five ep- episodes or so to get to 10 chapters. And here we have <laughs> this in the first two episodes here. I know we're blazing right through them. Like, like the f- flamethrowers, flames on the buildings that he did. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> we're going through this like the fire went through that brick store. That's right. Chapter 7, Scene 1. The elevator had taken forever to get to the top floor. Selina had jumped in it as soon as it had opened, pounding the down button and hoping that she was still in time to salvage some portion of her boss's speech. Thankfully, nobody else was going down just then, and she made the descent in under a minute. She ran through the lobby and out the main door of the department store. Boy, it sure was noisy out here. For a second, she was almost happy her boss never let her attend these things. Now where was he and all these people? Three motorcycles burst out of the crowd, headed straight for her. She jumped back out of the way as the cycles roared on by, still almost brushing her clothes. If she hadn't jumped, she would have been crushed. Boy, she thought, all those workouts at the gym had actually done her some good. But why weren't those cyclists looking where they were going? They could really hurt somebody. And the way everybody was screaming, was something wrong down here? Let's see, chapter 7. The first scene is from Selena's point of view. And she is waiting. She's still at the top of the building where she works. And she's, if we remember from last time, she realizes that she forgot to give her boss his notes for the speech. Or let's be fair, her boss forget to get his own damn notes (laughs) for the speech. Exactly. I thought the same thing. (laughs) Yes. So she's up there and she's like frantically pushing the elevator button, waiting for it to get there. And it finally gets to the top. And uh, she jumps in and pushes the down button. Um, it mentions that, thankfully, nobody called for the elevator to stop on the way down. So she's basically able to get all the way down to the ground floor. It took about a minute or so. But uh, for some of those big buildings, I'm sure that's quite good. I know there is a couple times I've been in Columbus and some of those buildings you have to you can take an elevator up to a point and then you have to get out and go to a different right. elevator and continue. So Yeah, since they're really tall, they split the elevators into different floors. Yeah, and and I guess it's not that tall and but maybe I mean express elevators were a thing as, at the time too and they went a little faster. Uh also everyone is out in the the street anyway for the big celebration, so uh Right. So that's probably why she was able to get down so quickly. So she's still hoping that there's time to salvage at least a little bit of her boss's speech. But she gets down to street level, and she's kind of struck with how noisy it is. She doesn't quite catch that there's a panic and right. stampede going on. <laughs> I got that too. It was like she doesn't – she was like it goes – everything's going nuts, but she just doesn't catch on that something bad is going on. She's just like, oh, it's just crazy down here. <laughs> yeah. So she's looking around for her boss, Max. And she barely manages to dodge three motorcycles that almost run her over. Mm -hmm. And she mentions, you know, thank goodness for the gym. (laughs) And why is everyone screaming? (laughs) And uh, I think it it gets into like a little bit more of her training later. But at at first I was like, well, yeah, uh, gym can make you fit and strong. It wouldn't really do 
necessarily anything for your situational or awareness or your reflexes. So I was, I was going to touch on that, but then they, we come across later that she's had a little bit more training than that. So I'm glad they went into that. Yes, me too. Yeah. Chapter seven, scene two. This was crazy. An organ grinder with a big red organ box and handlebar mustaches was the first one on the stage. And he had the usual monkey, except that this monkey had a gun. Max hoped it was a cap gun. The organ grinder grinned and turned his box toward the Christmas tree. He twisted the handle. Bullets spewed out of the box. It was a Gatling gun. Ornaments and lights exploded under the hail of bullets. Take that, Tannenbaum, the grinder yelled. Then we move into the second scene. The next one's when uh, he get, Max gets confronted by the, the organ grinder guy, right? Right, and yes. And the uh, knife-throwing lady. Uh, like, yeah. So, so I, I, this is in the movie too, and uh, like I, I like the scene because it, I really think the design of that organ grinder guy is just really a cool idea, and uh, like his organ grinder is a machine gun, and mm-hmm. uh, it's just cool. Like, that's just part of this motif that I'm really enjoying, and I really wish it leaned harder into this kind of circus group. Um, but uh, but I'm, I'm happy to get what little we get here. He, he gets confronted with these guys, and then he winds up. Uh, I think even Chip tells him to, but he leaves his son to deal with it and uh, leaves. Yeah. So it's like, you know, stacking on the idea that uh, Max is not like the most stand up guy, you know, like they tried to do it yeah. with the uh, Salvation Army thing um, a couple chapters ago. And uh, we're doing it here where he just leaves his son to save himself. Yeah, which is which is pretty funny. It is. It is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah, like you said, like the, the organ grinders up there on the stage, his monkey has a gun too. Yeah, apparently. That's right. Yeah. And it was kind of funny because, like, when you said, like, his uh, little crank box is a machine gun, it's when he, like, kind of shoots up the Christmas decorations, he says, take that, Tinnabomb. <laughs> and I was like, wait, what? I, I know of Tinnabomb as a, a common surname, but I looked it up, and it's the German word for fir tree. And that's the original lyrics of, oh, Christmas tree, yeah. oh, Christmas oh, tree. Yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and which... Apparently doesn't necessarily talk about Christmas. It's just actually talking about fir trees and their um, nature of being evergreen and whatnot. So I was like, okay, okay. And that's kind of a, an interesting, uh, you know, take that to the mom. All right. Okay. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, yeah, it is an interesting thing to shout out. I mean, I don't know. This is kind of, this is kind of an interesting group of people anyway. So yeah, definitely. <laughs> So yeah, you mentioned the the woman with the the, with the blades. There's a sword swallower on there also. Yeah, the sword swallower. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah, Max, Chip, and the mayor are on the stage, and you know Max wants to nope out of there, but he kind of can't quite get away. Chip and the mayor are kind of backing away. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the woman, the knife clad woman, she's like, "Oh, just relax. We just came for the guy who runs the show." So to Max's surprise, the mayor shows guts by stepping forward and the mayor asks you know what do you want from me and <laughs> this 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 is why i brought up the sword swallower because this <laughs> cracked me up he now keep in mind when a person swallows a sword that you can see they have to keep their torso really rigid and straight they can't bend their head like everything like that whole esophagus has to be very straight to keep everything in there Mm -hmm. so with that in mind the sword swallower has the sword in his mouth and he says and it even says in the narrative who somehow manages to say this around the sword not you shrek (laughs) so he's either bent at the waist and looking up at him or he's like looking up at the sky with the sword handle uh, sticking out of his mouth but I i thought that was kind of a funny (laughs) <laughs> the, the the idea that he still has the sword in his mouth and doesn't take it out before he says that. Yeah, that, that kind of made me laugh a little bit, too. <laughs> oh, and I like that we get a little taken aback by Max because um, uh, the mayor says that in the movie about uh, he steps up when they say we want the one in charge. And uh, but then they say they want Max. But in the book, I like that we get the step back from Max. It was like, huh, I'm su-. he's surprised that the mayor actually s- steps up. You know, and and is willing to take the responsibility of being the one in charge. Um, I like that <laughs> Max is uh, yeah. surprised by that because we see very quickly that Max is not that type of he person. He will not do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, once Max realizes that it's him that they're looking for, his son Chip actually steps up too, and uh, his son just kind of what do he say? He say, "Dad, save yourself." And uh, Max doesn't need to be told twice. So while they have his son and they've, I think, have nicked his ear 
and, you know, are holding a knife to him. And Max is already running pell-mell toward the relative safety of the crowd. He's out of there. So right at the end, the POV shifts just enough so that we're from Chip's point of view, using his vantage point on the stage so that he can see that the Batmobile has arrived. Right. A general thoughts on chapter six and seven so far? Uh, it's a lot of chaos. There's a lot thrown at you. And I mean, th- these scenes are like that in the movie. And I feel like, I feel, I feel like the book is getting that across, um, as well as the movie did. Um, that is just, there's a lot going on and they're throwing a lot at you. But, uh, but it, I mean, it's exciting to read. Chapter eight, scene one. Alfred was trapped by the surging crowd, still mere feet from the safety of the rolls. At the very minute that he had been about to re-enter his car, that large box had burst open, sending the crowd into a panic and pushing him a dozen feet away from his goal. There the car sat, bulletproof, shatterproof, with a phone inside with which he might be able to call Master Bruce and summon help. And there was no way he could reach it. Everyone was screaming and pushing futilely, one against the other. But the crowd seemed trapped by its very density, without direction. So, we're on chapter 8. And the first scene is from Alfred's point of view. Last time, I think Alfred had just returned to the Rolls Royce. He hadn't quite opened it up yet when the first uh, bit of chaos broke loose. So he's now pinned in by the crowds of people. And he's only a few feet in the Rolls Royce, but he can't get to it. And they mentioned that the Rolls is like bulletproof and shatterproof. It feels like, like yeah, he's like, getting trapped in the people and he's trying to get to the car because it's, it's armored i'm assuming that they even right. armored the regular roles um like I, f- I feel like like they could have played a little bit more with like you know alfred is possibly in danger of being you know crushed or you know getting hurt with all these people and he just needs right. to get to the car i mean i feel like they were trying to go for there they didn't i don't feel like they pushed it a little hard enough but um but i like what they were trying to do here yeah, because a, a stampeding crowd is nothing to mess with right like people get trampled and killed all the time and things like that. So uh, yeah, I think you're right that they really could have reached into some of like the panic maybe that Alfred might have been feeling at this point. I, I was surprised that he parked the rolls on like on the street. Right. I figured. <laughs> but then I guess like if with it being bulletproof and shatterproof, maybe he feels a little safer about letting it out among the uh, riffraff or whatever. Yeah. I mean, you would think uh, Bruce would have like, uh, like private spots like all over the city right that you could park or like alfred's not parking like in the middle of a square somewhere yeah i could see him totally having like a, a, a private parking spot in some underground garage under the department store and alfred can take an elevator from the p- garage right into the store and back down yep there was also a mention of a phone being locked in the car that was out of his reach. And I had a split second of like, why wouldn't he have his phone on him? Like, oh, this is 1992. This is not a cell phone. <laughs> right. This is like a big old car phone. So, yeah, he would not have a cell phone on him to call for help. Right. Yeah. It's going to be like some type of a, and I think they show in the movie a little bit, the, like a closed circuit little connection, but he has to get to the car to do it. Right. Right. So, uh, the motorcyclists are still going through the crowd, and now there are also three stilt walkers who are kicking the crowd. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure how feasible that would be in actuality. I'd imagine the stilts are kind of heavy and, or at least unwieldy. So, I don't know. I've never tried to kick someone while wearing stilts. I might be completely wrong. (laughs) I don't know. I'm kind of with you. I, I, I thought that too. I was like, Okay, well, these stilt guys, I can see them walking around and scaring people, but I don't see them kicking people because, I mean, they, <laughs> they're they doing enough to balance just walking around with the people running around. I can't imagine they'd have the dexterity to also kick people. But, I mean, they are the circus of crime, so maybe they <laughs> – Yeah, and I'm thinking, you know, why not do the old uh, Star Wars trick of, of, like, finding some way of tripping them up? I think it would be pretty easy to do. But Yeah, yeah, totally. Again, panic and chaos. People aren't thinking clearly. True. <laughs> um, Alfred hears a distinctive engine coming, and sure enough, the Batmobile is, is pulling up. Uh, it sounds like the Batmobile is able to cut through the crowd pretty easily. They don't talk about him running into inter- any inter- interference, which is surprising. Yeah, that's true. I didn't actually think about that because they have made such a big deal about how thick the crowds are. 
that once the Batmobile shows up, there's really no problem with him riding around without hitting civilians. <laughs> yeah, especially with this part. Um, so the first thing that the Batmobile does, it has blades that shoot out from either side of the Batmobile. I'm, I'm kind of imagining almost like Ben-Hur style. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Cutting through two pairs of the stilts. And how he manages to do that without also like eviscerating half the people in Gotham. <laughs> right. Because they're there. Like I'm just picturing these blades uh, attached to this car driving around, uh, going after these stilt walkers who we know are close to people because they're kicking them. So I, I mean, I, I'm definitely putting too much thought into this book for what it is, but that's a, my, a failing of mine. Uh, no, no. I mean, you're absolutely right because, uh, I mean, in the movie when they do it, he has these, uh, these things come out of the car that are just like bludgeons or sticks that just kind of pop out. He just kind of rolls past the stilt guys and trips them. And uh, okay, so yeah. in my head, that's what I'm thinking when I'm reading this scene. But like like you said, when it, the book says blades. So it's mm-hmm. like so, – so I thought that too. I was just like that doesn't make a lot of sense because like I mean there's more than just the stilt people out there. He's going to cut some people's legs off or something. Yeah. So apparently before shooting, they had a little change of heart there. Like, you know, maybe – Something else would be a little better. So Alfred sees a tattooed strongman coming at them. And there's this line, um, quote, it looked as if the butler would have to rescue the little girl, unquote. What little girl? Yeah. Do you know? Like, am I missing? Yeah, I, I don't know that. I went through that and I was like, it feels like something's missing here. And uh, I didn't know, I didn't know what it meant either because I wasn't for sure what it was talking about. Okay. I'm glad I'm not the only one because I I went through the previous pages and I I looked for a mention of a little girl. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if maybe she was mentioned briefly in like last, the, our last episode and they just didn't remind us because they, I guess they expected us to read through all this in one sitting or something. But yeah, I was just really confused about the little girl. So yeah, there's a lot going on and uh, maybe there was a bit about a little girl that got removed by accident. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. But yeah, it, that was confusing to me as well. And I kind of just went past it. And I'm like, I think something either got deleted or uh, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I think, in, and you know more about novelizations than I do, I'm guessing that there's a, a timeline um, that's probably more important than maybe like general novels or like, well, no, we want this to be out by the time the movie releases so that we can get as much uh, revenue as possible. So maybe people who write novelizations aren't afforded the same uh, luxury that a gen- like just a, a regular novel would have. Yeah. And, and I do know that, uh, I mean, for the 89 Batman one, the Craig... Shaw Gardner had, I think he wrote it in like a month, like it was super fast. And so and he got it out like in early May, I think so it was about a month before the movie came out. And I think the timeline was very similar uh, for this, like they gave him a very short time to write it. uh, And uh, I think it came out early as well, um, just because they were following the same pattern that he did for 89. But yeah, it's usually a very tight crunch and why they wind up using just an early script and don't really get to see the movie. Wow. Yeah. So kudos to them. You know, we we sometimes give them a hard time, but they are kind of uh, working with their back against the wall. Yeah. And uh, hey, kids, if you like NaNoWriMo, you too can write a novel in a month. So <laughs> just <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I gave it a shot this past year, but uh, it happened to fall right during fine, like around when finals week is. So that didn't work out very well. Yeah. I, I consider doing it. Like I, I may do, I, I should do it and try to write a novelization for a movie that never got a novelization. So yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see. I may, I may try that. I, I've toyed around with the idea of writing a novel adaptation for like a graphic novel that doesn't yet have an adaptation. Yeah. <laughs> I think that would be fun. It would be a lot of fun. Yeah. DC, Marvel, hit me up. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, let's see. Going back to the tattooed strongman, the Batmobile has these small black bat discs that shoot out. I was confused at first. I wasn't sure how they were. The, these discs were finding the bad guys without hitting oh, civilians. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And it, it turns out, like... There is a little bit of control in the, uh, that Batman is aiming the Batmobile. So I thought they were just kind of flying out and then kind of like homing in on the right person. But 
I almost had to read that in myself. They do this, the bat discs in the movie as well, and you see them shooting them out of the car and they hit the bad guys. Um, and reading it, it, like I didn't really think about it in the movie, but when I was reading it, I'm like, you again, you have the problem with the blades. There's so many people there and everyone's moving. <laughs> He's shooting these discs out of the sides of the car. He's going to hit everything except the crime thing. So <laughs> I have to assume that there's some kind of targeting mechanism. And like, like, cause I think later on in the movie, he has a batarang that actually has a little targeting radar in it. And I, I had right. to assume there's like a miniature version of that in these discs. So, so when he shoots him out before he shoots him, he targets who he's going to target. And then it just goes there. Um, because there's no other way I could see where he is not hitting people. Right. Because the best you can do, I think, even if you're Batman, if you're aiming something with your vehicle, the best you can do is just shooting it in the general direction of where you're wanting it to go. Right. It feels like a level of like a video game where it's like you're driving through Gotham and you have to shoot things from your car at things out the side, you know, and it's yeah. like you got to hope you hit just the villain. <laughs> so... Uh, one bat disc flies toward Alfred. Thankfully, Batman's trust in his butler isn't misplaced. The butler ducks, the blade goes over his head, or the, sorry, the disc goes over the head and hits the strong man behind him and knocks him out cold. Yep. I mean, I, I'm assuming Alfred does, you know, a lot of the same workouts the Batman does, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess in some of the iterations of Batman, when Alfred is just purely white haired i'm now thinking like he's actually just 47 years old he thinks <laughs> batman putting him through all this has just made him age he's prematurely. prematurely aged exactly <laughs> chapter eight scene two max couldn't believe it he had gotten away it just proved he guessed what a pair of still speedy legs and a belly full of fear can do for you but that fear could only take him so far he had to stop for a moment to catch his breath and decide on his next move he darted down a side street, free at last of all but a few members of the screaming mob. Max's steps slowed even more as he felt hot air coming up from a sewer grate below his feet. It felt oddly warm and reassuring compared to the winter chill around him, especially now that the sweat on his face and hands was exposed to the Gotham wind. Maybe he should stop here for a moment or two and reconnoiter, perhaps figure out exactly what was going on here. After all, he had just survived threats from criminals, a speedy chase, and a near capture. For the first time, Max wondered if there was some way he could turn all this to his advantage. So moving on to the next scene in Chapter 8, uh, we're at in Max's point of view. <laughs> and this is just a short little scene. Um, were you going to say something? No, no, I was laughing because, yeah, this, it's a <laughs> funny little scene. Yes. So Max is surprised that he was able to get some distance between himself and the killer circus. He turns down a side street and catches his breath, <clears throat> and he stands over a sewer grate for its warmth. Okay. And he thinks, well, maybe I should stand here over the grate for a moment or two to gather my wits. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> right. <laughs> so does he does he go into the vent at, at the end of this? I'm trying to remember now. I didn't put it in my notes if he actually fell down into the vent. Not yet, not yet. Not yet. Okay. Like, uh, in, in this one, uh, the last line of this scene was, for the first time, Max wondered if there was some way he turn could turn all of this to, to his, his advantage. advantage. Right. I have that in yeah. my notes. I couldn't remember, though, if it, if it right after that he fell in. But yeah, uh, but yeah, it is weird that uh, he goes into the side street. And uh, of course, Max is going to be like, how am I, how am I going to turn this to my advantage? Like, and, but it is weird that he's standing on a grate because, if I'm leaning up against a wall, walking in an alleyway, I'm not standing on a grate. I mean, for no, I mean, for no other reason than I honestly am worried that it's going to fall through. So right, right. <laughs> so it, like most normal people probably feel that. Yeah. Way. So I mean, especially people that live in Gotham. I mean, they're probably like, I mean, you walk on grate on a sidewalk, that's fine. But if you're just going into an alley and standing for a while on, you're not going to stand on a grate. So yeah, uh, it's kind of funny that he did that. I thought that too. I was thinking you know, this is foreshadowing with the <laughs> opacity set to 100%. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Chapter 8, Scene 3. Action always helped. He'd taken care of the worst of this band of thugs in the middle of Gotham Plaza. Now he had to mop up the trash on the outskirts. He turned the Batmobile toward three more of the criminals, who seemed intent on destroying the surrounding stores. These three were dressed as clowns. Batman found that particularly appropriate. He angled the Batmobile slightly so that all three were directly in his path, then pressed the accelerator. The clowns turned and fired on him. 
The bullets bounced harmlessly off the car's exoskeleton as the Batmobile sped toward its prey. <laughs> so um, the next scene is from Batman's point of view. And I, th- so I think this is like the first time we have it from Batman. We had a little bit from Bruce Wayne, but this is the first bit where we're in Batman's head, correct? Yes. Okay. So we find out that he, that action has always helped. So beating up bad guys is very therapeutic for him. Um, everyone needs a healthy hobby. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. You got to get, you got to get those demons out somehow. <laughs> right. So uh, apparently he's already gotten the worst of the thugs that are, who are terrorizing the citizens right now, they are in the middle of the plaza. And now he is working on the lesser thugs on the outskirts because there's still apparently no sign of the GCPD. Right. right. They're not, they're not going to come in. They're like, Oh, Batman's here. I'm, I'm staying in my car. <laughs> let's go get a, Let's go get some coffee. Right. Well, this is good. I'm stay co- it's cold out here in my cop car. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Batman s- sees three clowns and he speeds toward them. Because it's cold. He doesn't want to get out of the Batmobile either. And I'm glad you brought that up because I I like actually how they handle this where he hasn't gotten out of the car yet. Like he's dispersing criminals like doom, doom, doom and not even gotten out of the car yet. He's using the car to eliminate a lot of these villains. And I like – I really like this. I really like how this is being handled. Yeah, because I I loved – the the gadgetry of the Batmobile. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember the shields going up yeah. in the eighty nine Batman. So with the eighty nine Batman, I, I watched that and rewatched that so many times that I remembered a lot of it. This one, like I said, I, I only watched a couple of times. So there's only like right now, I'm not remembering any of this. There is something that happens with Selena a little bit later that I remember. But yeah, I, I kind of can't wait to watch this and kind of see how the even though like it's only been a couple years since the last movie if there have been any advancements in what kind of special effects they use for the vehicle Hmm. yeah okay so he speeds he's speeding toward the clowns as you do the (laughs) clowns shoot (laughs) the clowns shoot at him but of course the bullets do nothing um, apparently they don't know who Batman is (laughs) yeah they don't get it bulletproof they don't get it (laughs) (laughs) so one clown is smart enough to jump out of the way, and the other two, uh, Batman just plows into them. <laughs> yes, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and he starts to head toward the fire breather, who's still setting toy stores on fire, but he, then he realizes that t- the two clowns have managed to cling to the hood. So apparently he didn't hit them with, like, lethal force. That doesn't come till later. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> I bet Batman was thinking they would jump out of the way as well, and when they didn't, it kind of took them by surprise. So. They, they tripped over their giant shoes. Yes. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So these guys are still hanging on to the hood of the Batmobile. He, he goes after the fire breather and the clown that he hadn't hit is behind him, shooting at him from behind. So he, he slams on the brakes. Newton's law of <laughs> physics, uh, the, the hood clowns go flying and the Batmobile does this really cool thing that it did in the first novelization where he was kind of down in a narrow alley. And instead of doing like a 57 point turn, he just pulls a lever and the Batmobile kind of turns on like it, the, the wheels stay and like the whole car gets up and rotates. Yeah. It drops down like a mechanical arm and it lifts the car up and spins it around and drops it back down. Oh yeah. Okay. So the, the wheels do move. Okay. Yeah. And I missed that. Part. It's really cool. And, uh, you're right. I'm glad you brought that up. They did put it in the first novelization. He did it there as well. That was not in the movie for the first movie. Um, and I'm wondering if they just didn't have either the time or the budget to make that work for the first movie. So then, right. so then I, pre- I bet they just redid it and they're like, Hey, we still have that effect. Why don't we do that for the second movie? Which I'm glad they did because it's a really cool effect. I like it. Yeah. I, I do, I do like that effect actually. So yeah, he, he gets the car turned around and let's see, as he's driving toward the, the, this clown, he realizes that, uh, the fire breather is on his feet. So apparently he had hit the fire breather too. It was just, it wasn't talked about specifically. Yeah. I was just, I was just trying to think like, did he hit him or was the fire breather just over there where he finally wound up? I like, it was not, you're right. It's not really spelled out how the fire breather got there. Yeah. So like, I didn't even realize that, you know, cause I thought he had focused his attention back on the clowns that are on his hood, but I didn't even know that the fire breather had been taken down until it, specifically said that Batman was surprised that he had regained his feet. Mm -hmm. This part coming up was kind of, that kind of surprised me. So the fire breather 
Uh, for one, I, I don't think the range on fire breathing would be <laughs> very big. So I'm kind of surprised like, this is even an option for him to try to breathe fire onto the Batmobile. But Batman sees that he's about to breathe fire and it's not going to do anything to the Batmobile. The Batmobile is going to be fine. Yeah, it is. But for whatever reason, <laughs> Batman slams on the accelerator in order to get like a puff of exhaust, which is flammable, apparently. Because the fire breather goes up in flames. Yeah, this this is a strange thing because they do it in the movie, and uh, it looks like he flips a switch and it shoots flame out the back, and then he takes off. And I mean, we laugh because it's, he's a fire breather and he gets set on fire. Um, right. And the movie doesn't really acknowledge much more than that. The book kind of gives you like Batman gives gives thinks it's funny. You can tell the book <laughs> lets you know that Batman thinks it's funny that he just set the fire fire breather on fire um uh, i like i like i thought it was a funny gag but i don't think there's been any (laughs) like there's no way the batmobile shoots that much flame out the back of it it's uh yeah i mean even the batmobile from the 66 series which did that where this whole thing started didn't really do a lot of fire either um so but it's a neat trick and uh it made me laugh but it, it was just, it struck me because Batman's kind of anti killing. Well, and if yeah. this guy doesn't get doused, this is one of the worst ways to die. That's true. Is it like Batman doesn't kill people? Systemic infection from third degree burns <laughs> kills <Okay>. people. <laughs> I mean, maybe he figures, like, hey, stop, drop, and roll. There's I, there's snow around. You know, the clown's fine. <laughs> the, the, the sewer is right there. Just drop yeah, in. Just you'll drop be in. fine. He's, he's fine. He's a he's, he's a fl- yeah. he's a fire breather. Like he he deals with flame all the time. <laughs> right, true. It's an occupational hazard. Exactly. So, <laughs> all right, I feel a little better about this now. <laughs> so, uh, the scene ends with Batman thinking, "Okay, what was that last clown up to? Maybe he could give him a hot time as well." <laughs> okay, so we're just gonna set people on fire now. <laughs> yep, part of my repertoire now. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that was pretty fun. I'm going to do it again. <laughs> I'm going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, so uh, chapter nine is the first one where we have a little bit of dialogue. So let's take a look at that on the stage of... Rest in Peace Theater is proud to present That Time Selena Kyle Ruins Her Shoes. Selina supposed it was too late to give Max's speech. In fact, the way this crowd was moving, it seemed to be too late to do much of anything. Then she had this clown grab her. A guy actually dressed in a clown suit pulled her from the steps and stuck the muzzle of a gun against her neck. He muttered something about, Never taken me alive. Somehow, Selina doubted he wanted to start a conversation. She heard something crack as the clown dragged her in front of him. Somehow, she managed to look down and saw that her brand new heel had snapped off her brand new fashion pump. That was it, Selena thought. Those heels cost her money. Now she was mad. I probably shouldn't bring this up, she said pointedly to the terrifying clown. But this is a very serious pair of shoes you ruined. The terrifying clown stared at her in astonishment. Couldn't you have just been a prince and broken my jaw? My body will heal, but that was the last pair left in my size. All these innocent bystanders, and I had to pick you? Selina opened her mouth to respond. Shut up! Boy, Selina thought. Somebody around here had really gotten up on the wrong side of bed. This creep had his gun stuck in her face now. Maybe, she considered, she should be worried about more than her shoe. The Batmobile screeched to a halt in front of them. The door flew open, and a man dressed all in black leapt out and headed straight for them. It was Batman. An acrobat somersaulted out of the crowd. These circus people were everywhere. He headed straight for the man in black, whose muscular costume also featured a very good-looking cowl and cape. Batman punched the acrobat's lights out with one very well-placed fist. This got the terrifying clown's attention. He waved his gun at Batman for an instant, then quickly brought the muzzle back to Selina. Listen up, Mr. Man-Bat, he said very loudly in Selina's ear. You take one step closer and I'll... Batman looked back and smiled. Sure, was all he said. He whipped out some sort of gun from a holster on his hip and fired a spear toward the clown. The clown jerked his head away as the spear buried itself into the wall behind them. 
The terrifying clown started to laugh. Oh, nice shot, mister. But Batman wasn't through. There was a line connected to the spear, a line Batman tugged sharply. A piece of wall fell forward with the spear, right on the head of the terrifying clown. The gunman staggered. Selina saw her chance. You shouldn't have left the other heel. She drove the point of her remaining shoe into the terrifying clown's knee, making him lose his balance the rest of the way. Clown and gun went tumbling to the ground. Batman stepped forward and leaned over his fallen foe. A gloved hand reached down and brushed at a crimson triangle tattoo over the terrifying clown's left eye. Selina stared. Was that significant? The Batman, hero to millions, and pretty well built besides, was mere inches away from her. Come on, Selina thought. This is the chance of a lifetime. Say something. Wow. The Batman. Or is it just... Batman? He didn't reply. She tried to smile. Your choice, of course. Batman looked up, and for a moment their eyes met. He had very nice eyes. She thought she saw the slightest bit of a smile beneath his mask. Gotta go. And he was gone, half a block away in a matter of seconds, off to talk with Commissioner Gordon. The crowd gathered around the two and started to cheer. That was it? Her big meeting with Batman? Not that she could blame him. It was no wonder he didn't wait around with her terrible attempts at conversation. Well, that was very brief. Like most men in my life. <laughs> what men? She looked down at the unconscious clown at her feet. Well, there's you, but let's face it, you need therapy. She knelt beside the clown and picked up his gun. She had never gotten a close look at the weapon when it was pressed into her neck. It wasn't a regular gun at all. It had more of a futuristic look to it. Like it shot out electricity or something. She pointed it at the clown. Whoops, maybe she pulled the trigger. The clown stiffened for a second, as if he'd been hit by a jolt from the gun. So she definitely pulled the trigger. Electro shock therapy. What a bargain. Now we both feel better. Max heard the sound of cheers. Maybe all the carnage was over. Maybe he should go back and join the celebration. The sewer grate he was standing on opened up. Max fell before he could even utter a proper scream, and as he fell, he saw the sewer grate pop back into place overhead. He landed in something soft, but he didn't stop moving. Something had grabbed him around the ankles, and that something was dragging him into the darkness. For the sake of form, Max screamed for real. I had to try not to snort when he said he landed in something soft. I'm like, eh, you're in the sewer. I don't want to yeah, know what I'm you not landed in. Sure, I want to know. <laughs> <laughs> I so far really don't like this version of Selena Kyle. I'm sure it's just for the movie and to kind of show the big difference and change when she goes through the transformation. Right. But I'm so used to her being kind of like a strong character that this. This one, I'm just not really liking at all. Yeah, I mean, they, they do show in the movie she's kind of mousy and kind of uh, squeamish a bit. And then, I mean, they, they at least, for me, when I see it, and you know, I, I'm a guy reading this, so this is my read. But um, I, I see her be the squeamish part a little bit. But then she has a little bit of, I guess, I call it moxie or fire that's kind of buried down in there. And then she shows it a little bit with the clown and, uh, and he, and here, so it shows that she's at least, they're at least trying to show that she's got some stuff buried down in there that is probably going to come out later on in the book. Um, is it, is it great? No, it's not great characterization. Um, but I, I feel like they're at least trying a little bit here. Yeah. I mean, I liked her initially, like, with, because, because I think you're right at the beginning, it was more mousiness and a lot of timidity. Um, but then she'd kind of say stuff under her breath that, that mm -hmm. gave that little bit. I think what bothered me about this scene in particular was that she was worried about her shoe. And I wasn't <laughs> sure if she was just trying to antagonize the clown because she kind of came off a bit as an airhead in the scene. And I didn't think of her as an airhead. Like, even if, if she were mousy and whatnot, she could be very intelligent. But here she's not understanding that the crowd is in a panic. She's not really sure what's going on. And then she's worried about her shoe when she has a literal gun to her neck. Yeah. I, and that's a very valid point. And uh, I, I didn't think about that with the... Um the joke about the heels and stuff. And, uh, and it does seem 
it does seem out of kind of out of place for her because it didn't really feel like she ever showed that she cared about that much about shoes or anything like that. Um, so right. So yeah, it, it did seem odd. So I mean, my guess would be just like you said is maybe it was there just to for her to fire some things at the clown, and it didn't really mean anything. It was just stuff that she could say to him, I guess. But right. But yeah, I don't love that either. I, I mean, they have some of that heel stuff in the movie, and I don't like it there <laughs> either. Um, yeah, I do like. Uh, in the movie, when, when she's talking to Batman, uh, he doesn't really say anything. I mean, he just kind of smiles and walks away. In the book, he actually says a couple things. And, you know, I got to go and, you know, and stuff like that. And I, I like that better. I like that he answered a little bit. Um, and I, I wish they would have done that in the movie rather than him just kind of awkwardly stare at her and then walk away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that that was Chapter 9. Um and again, like my my big complaint was that was just having they should have the mousiness and timidity without the the massery, if that's a word. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I agree. <laughs> anyway, um, so now we're on to chapter ten. Chapter ten, scene one. Thanks for saving the day, Batman. Commissioner Gordon said in all sincerity. Thanks for making the rest of us look like a bunch of dolts. He laughed, a trace of envy in his voice, but he shook his head as he watched his men rounding up the wounded thugs. I'm afraid the Red Triangle Circus Gang is back. Batman surveyed the remains of the carnage around him. We'll see, was his only reply. The first scene is Gordon's point of view, and Gordon is thanking Batman for saving the day and making thanks for making the rest of us look like a bunch of dolts. Like dolts. He actually said dolts. <laughs> yeah, and like... Dude, you, the, your department didn't do shit. Know, <laughs> you like, guys, did, you made yourself look like dolts. Yeah, yeah. They could have at least added a little backup, but no, they were wrapped up in their snuggies in the cop cars, like, <laughs> drinking coffees. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, taking bets and doing commentary on the stilt walkers being taken down. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure the implication is there that GCPD is doing what they can. And I'm, I'm sure they show some of that in the movie, but it was just kind of funny that it wasn't even touched upon at all. So it just made it look like Batman was doing all the work and GCPD were just completely out of it. 100%. Yeah. It's kind of that way in the movie too. They, you don't really see the oh, yeah. cops either. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's pretty much like it is in the book. <laughs> oh goodness. Well, uh, so Gordon continues, um, I'm afraid the Red Triangle Circus Gang is back. So that was the name of that gang. Which right. They actually name it here. And then Batman's like, we'll see. And I'm like, what does that mean? <laughs> and we're like, mm-hmm. like, it feels like they're building to something that's going to be later in the book. But it, it ultimately comes no- goes nowhere. But um, I like that they at least give the answer. Like, this is the Red Triangle Gang. They're a thing. They're an entity. Right. And I, the, in chapter nine, where we did rest in peace theater, there, I think there's a bit of narrative where, uh, Batman kind of rubs at a marking on the, the clown. And I think it was like a tattoo or something that maybe didn't come off. Yeah. Uh, That's right. Yep. So apparently, like when he, when he saw that and noticed that he immediately realized it wasn't clown makeup, he knew it was something. So he, he, apparently he is familiar with the, uh, Red Triangle Circus Gang, and it sounds like Gordon is familiar with them as well. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Batman's aware. He is aware. <laughs> oh, yeah. He is so aware. <laughs> he knows everything. Um, so the caped crusader – oh, sorry. So before Gordon can get clarification of uh, when Batman says, we'll see, uh, the mayor shows up, and he's like, the caped crusader, we don't deserve you. They almost made off with our mover and shaker, Max Shrek, but – and he looks around. He's like, where is that insufferable son of a bitch? <laughs> so um, at that point, Batman vanishes from pretty much beneath the mayor's nose, and Gordon is amused because for once it's not him right. <laughs> who who is left hanging, and he kind of envies Batman's freedom to nope out of any situation, which I can, I can, that, that's one thing I, I can really empathize with Gordon about. I'm very much an introvert and I'm the type I try to sneak out of parties to go home yeah. <laughs> rather than sneaking out of the home to go to parties. So, um, yeah, I can definitely empathize with that. Yeah. I mean, and they even call this out. Gordon hates doing like glad handing and doing politician stuff. They call it out in the last novelization too. I think when we're first introduced to him, he's at a politician's dinner and he hates it. Um, And and so, I mean, I I like that they keep that consistency here. And I like that Gordon is so happy that it happened to the mayor. And he's just like, I've never envied (laughs) Batman more. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah, it's one of the things uh, about Gordon's character. I think it's one of my favorite parts about him is just that he's a commissioner. He likes he likes that job because uh, it's it's where it's his rank. It's what he's done for the police force. But he doesn't like the political side of that job. He just kind of has to take the good with the bad. Chapter 10, Scene 2 Selena threw open the door to her apartment. Honey, I'm home. She waited for the answering silence before finishing the joke. Oh, I forgot. I'm not married. It was an old joke, but it was her joke. She laughed dutifully as she looked around her studio digs. The pink wall-to-wall carpet that went so well with her off-white furniture. Her fully stocked dollhouse. That quilt she'd get around to finishing some day. Her substantial collection of stuffed animals. And that neon, hello there, sign, which would greet her when there was no man to do the job. Plus, of course, she had a Christmas tree to cheer the place up even more. Now, if her job would only allow her enough time to enjoy this place. Oh well, a working woman couldn't have everything. So the second scene is from Selena's point of view. She gets home to her apartment, and she opens up with, Honey, I'm home. Oh, I forgot. I'm not married. So <laughs> this book miserably miserably fails the Bechdel test. <laughs> True. <laughs> it is... Uh, I don't know if this was just part of the desperation of her character or if maybe this was still early enough in the 90s that they thought that this is what women women always thought about like being married and and having a boyfriend and whatnot but i don't know yeah it's odd it's a little weird Hmm. yeah (laughs) so her apartment is wall-to-wall pink which is also i don't associate with selena kyle but right but i i don't know maybe i could see where it's maybe her now and but it won't be her later right if they're really setting up for that night and day switch yeah. which I, I can i can get behind that um she has a fully stocked dollhouse and a quilt she's been working on a large collection of stuffed animals and a neon hello there sign and that's what i remember mm-hmm. is when she d- changes that sign coming up later yeah the hello there sign is i think one of my favorites part i'm a sucker for neon signs i don't know why I, I'm a nictophile. I love the nighttime and I love cities at night because I love that contrast between like light and darkness and neon lights just kind of really emphasize that. So I'm like, I, I would love to have a neon sign in my house somewhere. That's cool. Yeah. And it's a neat one. And it's neat how it changes later, how she changes it later. But like, even as it is here, hello there. I just think that's a neat, cute sign for her to have. But uh, I agree. I like neon signs too. And I think that this is a neat one in her little space that she has. Yeah, I would use the neon sign to illuminate the rest of the house. I think that'd be cool. Yeah. But anyway, um, so she takes off her coat and she realizes that she still has the stun gun that she had taken from the clown. Now, it sounded like before when she pointed the gun at the clown and fired, it didn't seem like any kind of projectiles came out. Like, you know how the stun guns usually have those uh, electrodes that shoot out? Right, yes. It almost seems like in this one, there's some kind of technology where you just kind of point and pull the trigger and like it somehow stuns them without making contact. Right. It's, it it is different. Um, yeah. Cause in the movie, it looks like a traditional, like, I mean, it looks like a hand, like electric razor. Um, and, and you just, you put it on someone and it stuns them. But in the book, you're right. It's described different. It sounds more like a traditional gun that shoots a zap or something. Uh, right. It's very confusing. I I had trouble picturing it. Yeah. So yeah, she has the sun gun. I think it's a fair trade for the heel. So I, I would have kept it <laughs> totally. <too. laughs> um, she hears a meow, and through the half open window comes Miss Kitty. As she, uh, Selena says, back from more sexual escapades you refuse to share. Like even the cat fails the Bechdel right. Cat I was test. I was like, waiting for that. Yep. <laughs> 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 My goodness. Um, and I was also a little worried about her leaving. They didn't mention that she opened a window when she got home. So I'm guessing she left, she had the window open, which makes me worry about leaving a window open in Gotham, in Gotham City. City. But yeah. You don't leave windows open in Gotham City. No. You just don't do that, honey. Especially because, I mean, she can't live in a nice part of town. No. <laughs> so anyway, um, Selena is out of cat food. So she pours some milk. Um, hopefully the cat is accustomed to milk. Otherwise, it's going to puke all over that pink carpet. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it mentioned that she was out of cat food again. So I'm guessing this might be a, a normal thing. So hopefully the cat is not 
therefore lactose intolerant. <laughs> um, Selena wishes she could have the carefree life of a cat. Once again, foreshadow opacity set to 100%. Oh, yeah. Uh, Selena has a dialogue with her cat, which is kind of sad. Um, not for the fact that she's talking to her cat, because, like, research shows that more people, like, a lot more people than people would admit talk to themselves or do something like that. But what's sad is, like, when she is voicing for the cat, she calls herself pathetic. Mm -hmm. But anyway, she goes to her answering machine, and it's like, yeah, do those even still exist anymore? I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess in digital form. Is yeah. But yeah, they don't have anything like that anymore. <laughs> so, you know, while she goes to the, the answering machine, her, her gaze falls upon pictures of herself from happier times when she was a kid. So a little, a little, a little sad there. Yeah, they're really hammering home how sad her life is right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so she starts going through her messages. And the first one is from her mother, who's disappointed that Selena won't be home for the holidays and thinks that Selena is just kind of languishing in Gotham as a lowly secretary. And Selena's like, no, lowly assistant. <laughs> um, the next is from her boyfriend, Paul. And I'm like, what boyfriend? You're sitting here worried about not having a guy and you have a boyfriend? Yeah. <sighs> It's surprising. <laughs> so, uh, apparently, you know, that whole thing with, you know, beggars can't be choosers. I mean, geez. Um, but he's telling Selena that about this Christmas getaway that they had planned, um, that he's going, he's now going to go alone because Dr. Shaw said that he needed, needed to be his own person and not an appendage, which of course sets up that appendage joke. Uh, right, right. Well, and, and is there any, is there any question that Paul's not going with the doctor on that trip and not, <laughs> not Selena? <laughs> hmm, yeah, I didn't even think about that because I was thinking like, yeah, it's kind of like a, a shitty thing to do. Dr. Schaff to, you know, get this person to just leave their girlfriend high and dry when they've been planning this and probably put money into it. But yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe there's uh, something else going on there. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, so the third message is from, I'm guessing, uh, an instructor at a rape prevention class um, saying that they miss Selena at the classes and it's not enough to master a martial art. You, you must stop seeing yourself as a victim. So this uh, made me think of two possible scenarios or it gave me two questions. So, you know, one, was she raped? So like she have to, you have to stop seeing yourself as a victim. So was she raped in the past? Otherwise, you know, is that implying that then that only victims get raped? Like, don't see yourself as a victim and you won't get raped. So I was kind of playing around with, with how that was worded and what, which one of those two, or if it's like a third one that I'm not thinking of. And then like the other one is just kind of nitpicky where, um, it's a, a rape self-defense class and then talking about mastering a martial art. And I'm like, it wouldn't be a, a rape self-defense class. It would just be a class of that martial art. But like I said, I'm just being nitpicky at this point. Right. No, but, but you picked up two things that I did as well. Um, cause this final message from, this gruff lady from, I, I forget where it said it was, if it was like a YMCA or a gym or whatever. That's not in the movie. Paul is the last one. Uh, she gets her mom and Paul in the movie, but we, we don't get this gruff lady, which gives us these pieces of information. And I took the exact same things you did. I was like, so they're giving us that she possibly was raped in the past, which mm -hmm. m maybe gives you some of that sheepish behavior we get in the beginning where she's just kind of, you know, reticent about things because she's got these, these issues with a possible rape in the past. And, uh, and she's doing something about it, uh, like taking martial arts classes, you know, to build up her confidence where maybe that's where she's getting some of the talking back to the clown and stuff like that. So right. it's, it's trying to full circle some of these things. And I appreciate it. it's not a lot, but at, at least it's something, you know. Yeah, and that was what I was talking about when she jumped out of the way of the motorcycle right. and, was, and was thankful for, for the gym. Like, we find out a little bit later, she has a little bit more training that whether she was raped or whether it's just in these self-defense classes, either way, she's going to have more situational awareness, which is a, a good thing for anyone to have. True. That little message there kind of opens up a, a little can of worms and you're like, okay, is what what's going on here? So... Anyway, the fourth and final message is Selena herself, as she's phoned a message to herself because um, she right. apparently That's knows right. that she's kind of <laughs> she's kind of um, absent-minded, which a girl I can relate. <laughs> um, so she <laughs> so she sent a message to herself, which is kind of smart. This is before the day where we could type notes to herself or whatever on our iPhones. But it says, "Hi, Selena. This is yourself calling to remind you, honey, that you have to come back to the office." 
unless you remember to bring home the Bruce Wayne file, because the meeting's on Wednesday and Max Slave Master wants every pertinent fact at your lovely tapered fingertips. It's a little interesting that she re- it describes her fingertips. But, <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> well, and then she, I mean, goes back to calling herself corn dog. And uh, didn't she, like deep fried corn dog? <laughs> like she really, yeah, she really like, digs in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like wash your mouth out with, <laughs> know, right? with mustard or something. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's interesting that you know sometimes she calls herself pathetic or a corn dog, and other times she's sent calling herself honey. And so yeah, it's uh, a little bit of a, an imbalance there, which is probably what they were going for. But then she, oddly. And it kind of reminded me of the first movie when the Joker turned off the TV with that boxing glove thing that would shoot out and he would punch through the TV to turn it off. Selena turns off the answering machine with a stun gun. (laughs) I was like, what? (laughs) Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was kind of weird. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, she, she calls herself a deep fried corn dog and she prepares to head back to the office. And it says, for some reason, Miss Kitty meowed goodbye foreshadowing transparency <laughs> or opacity set to 100 percent. making sure the road ahead is fully lit <laughs> <laughs> yeah so yeah that's the end of chapter 10 so what what do you think of these these five chapters <laughs> i mean there's a, kind of a lot going on and uh i i kind of like some of the action we're getting and i kind of like some of the setup i don't know some of the dialogue is a little contrived and uh, but i kind of like what it's, i mean it's a novelization so i mean it's right. doing a few things the movie didn't do that i would have liked to have actually seen in the movie it just and it's not a lot it's like a, just a couple little tail ends of scenes here and there and uh and i'm liking what it's doing so i i'm i mean 10 10 chapters in i'm, I'm liking it so far yeah i'd like for it to go a little deeper yeah and that just might be me like you obviously have more experience with novelizations is it a common thing that novelizations kind of stay on the surface or do some of them kind of go a bit deeper? Uh, that I mean, it depends. I mean, more often than not, you'll see them really kind of stay surface um, okay. just because they don't have the time to kind of dig in. You will find the odd uh, novelization that really kind of just blazes its own trail and will really Mm -hmm. dig in deep on certain characters. And it's like, those are kind of fun to read, but more often than not, there's not really enough time for them to explore as much as you would honestly really like. Okay. I want to say like one that, that you've covered in one of one of your episodes was the ET. Yes. And I, I really want to get my hands on that uh, when I have time to sit down and, and read it. But that sounded really fascinating. Yeah. There's another one. Uh, the, the next episode I'm going to do is for the Goonies. It's another one that kind of, I love yeah, the Goonies. that novelization digs in as well um, and gives some fun stuff, some, a lot of fun extra stuff um, and digs in a bit more into the characters. So it's, uh, that's another one that's really good. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I mean, that's a good segue. Do you want to tell the listeners where they can find you? Uh, sure. You can find me uh, every month. I do I Read Movies, uh, the podcast about movie and TV novelizations. Um, it's, uh, I try to get it out around the 15th of the month. Sometimes I hit it, sometimes I don't. Um, I took a break in January, but uh, February's episode is going to be, like I said, The Goonies Um uh, written by James Kahn, I think is his name. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, I, I've i recorded it, but I haven't edited it. So uh, it's it's a lot of good extra stuff. I think you're going to enjoy it. Um, you can find me personally on Twitter. I'm pretty responsive at my name, Paxton Holly, P-A-X-T-O-N-H-O-L-L-E-Y. Um, so th- those are the main places. I have a couple of other podcasts and stuff, but, um, but uh, those are the main ones you can find me. Okay. And as for Batman books, uh, you can email me at dark knight pros at gmail.com or find me at twitter at batman books underscore dkp i would love to hear from you so for the next episode i'm guessing we're going to cover chapters 11 through 15 
or isn't misplaced because oops sorry mm-hmm. cat and all-, all right i got my book got my book uh, i just took a swig of some diet orange soda i'm gonna try to do this without burping the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so i do i apologize i'm gonna try to do it without getting into a coughing fit so <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, i hope you're you're feeling better <laughs> yes i definitely on the downswing of that so good 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 batman was created by or bleh, bleh, 